Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Pete Morrison. I'm the CEO of Vic Water, and it's a real pleasure to be with you today. We have a wonderful event uh, in school for you today. Uh, as you can see, it's called Smoothing the Path for Disability Employment in the Water Industry. Have a great lineup of speakers. Uh, I'll be introducing them as we work through the session today. In the first instance, I'd encourage you to make sure you turn off all other software or other programs that might actually distract uh, in terms of the bandwidth that you're working with in using Webinar Jam for today. So please do that. Uh, just make yourself comfortable. Uh, and, also, and also just recognising that uh, we will be recording this session and being able to share that with everyone today. So please be aware that it is being recorded. Now, uh, as we work through the session today, uh, there'll be an opportunity we, we expect for some questions to be answered. So if you have questions, uh, please uh, put them through the chat, which is on the right side of the screen. It's a fairly simple way of doing it. So you'll see the chat function and throw in a question. And you might want to just say hello to everyone right now as we, as we get into the session. I'm going to just acknowledge uh, the country uh, and I will now move to that. We would love to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands from which we are each joining this session. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and recognise their role in managing the land's resources over thousands of years. We acknowledge them and their continued connection to places we go about managing water resources today. What an incredible legacy the traditional owners have left us and it is wonderful to be able to acknowledge them today. So I'm going to introduce our keynote for today, Bo Vernon. You'll see here in the script that Bo's had an incredible career and life and Bo's life really changed on the 23rd of June, 2012. I'm not going to go into great detail because Bo's going to tell you his story today. And it's been a change that Bo's uh, had to work with. And I think there are a number of positives that Bo's going to share with you today. And one thing that I've asked Bo to do for this session is to be able to share uh, as part of his life uh, some of the things that he's doing with organisations that are assisting people with disabilities to get employment. And to, so today we'll be really focusing on how you can involve people with disabilities in employment. What are the things that you need to look for? And out of this session, we'll indeed be providing a short and helpful summary uh, document of what you need to do, a simple pack in which you can then get some tips on how you can engage and employ people with disabilities because we wanna smooth the path. We wanna make it as easy as possible. So I'm going to hand over to Bo. Welcome, Bo. It's great to have you here, and I look forward to, to hearing your presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Pete, um, and, and thanks. Thanks very much for having us. Uh, yeah, really enjoyed our discussions over a period of time around around disability employment, and I'm I'm so I'm so passionate about the about the area, and um, I hurt myself at age 23. Um, and now sit here, sit here in a wheelchair. But before I hurt myself, I had no idea about about disabilities. I had no exposure uh, to it. And to be totally totally honest, um, if I if I was exposed to it, I probably would have ran the other way, scared of um, of what was different. Um, and I'm very thankful for for being in a wheelchair now and and being exposed to um, the disability community because it has just made me a far, far better person. Um, so today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak to you around a, a, a couple of different things and everything I say, it's not a, not a, it's not a poor me story. I live, I live an awesome, awesome life and um, just everything I say is just some things I've learned along my journey and some things I've, I've been exposed to and, and some messages I'd like to pass 
on to, to people here with us um, or the people that might watch the recording. So um, I've just got a few statistics up there to start off with. Um, roughly one in five people in Australia live with a disability, which, you know, is quite a surprise when, uh, when I first found out about that as over 4 million people with a disability in Australia and 2.2 million people of working age. And of that 2.2 million, only 23% are in paid employment. Now, that's roughly, you know, 1.7 million people with a disability that of working age that are unemployed um, or don't have paid, paid employment. Um, and Australia, we see ourselves as a pretty um, progressive country and, and whatnot. We rank 21 out of 29 for OECD countries in terms of our disability employment rates and 27 out of 29 for people with disability at risk of living in poverty. And those numbers, you know, are quite, they're very, very disappointing and, and something that we need to, we need to improve on. And, and something that I really want to help. So I, I don't know how my mic went off or how long that had been off, off for. Um, but, yeah, he, here's myself at... Um, at 20, 20 years of age is, um, yeah, and I'm a little bit harsh on myself here, but um, that person that you see in that photo in front of you didn't realise how good he had it. I, um, I uh, you know, probably I lacked a lot of gratitude and grateful for the things around me. I had no exposure to diversity. Um self-centered and in that just thought about myself a lot and didn't really think about um, other people as, as much as, as I could have. Limited exposure to failure and adversity, didn't appreciate different opportunities that I had and lacked emotional intelligence and, and understanding. And, and even though I am quite harsh on myself right there, you know, those things I have developed and grown significantly in those areas since hurting myself. And it frustrates me so much that that bloke in that photo there that lacked all those things is far more likely to get employed over um, the person sitting in front of you right now in, in terms of myself. Um, and it frustrates me so much. And the reason why there is um, less people with um, disability employed is there is there's a stigma and negative biasy um, that having a disability is bad, and and we feel sorry for them. We feel pity. Um, having a disability isn't bad. It, it just is, and it's just a different different way of living. And our biggest disability quite often isn't our physical one or, or our diagnosis. Um, our biggest disability is the society that we live in. Um, if people with a, with a disability, um, you know, believe that it is bad and if other people believe it is bad, then, then that's what it is. Um, but if we can change that narrative of going, all right, someone with a disability, that, that's not a bad thing. We don't feel sorry for them. We understand it might be challenging at times, but you know they're just people like like everyone else. Um, the better we are able to break down that stigma and negative bias. Um, the stigma is shown in statistic the statistics that I sh showed before through people being scared to engage with people with disability. Um, an example and a story that I have have for you is that. When I got out of rehabilitation, I couldn't go back to my previous line of work. And I was then on a disability support pension. Now, I can stay, at, I hurt myself at 23 years of age. I can stay on that disability support pension for the rest of my life 
without the need to um, show that I'm trying to get work or even even try and get any work ever. Now, to me, that that is just uh, a, you know that stigma that having a disability is bad and that people with disability can't do much because I, I feel that you know myself I can work just as much as as the next person as the next person can work and for me to be able to sit on the disability support pension for the rest of my life without trying or having to show doing anything is one of those stigmas um, but things like what Vic Water are doing here lay and and, uh, and the water community about um, yeah having this presentation will help break down those those barriers and the stigma I'm sure so yeah at, at 23 years of age I um I I was playing Australian rules football I grew up um, yeah loving Australia Aussie rules football, I played high level, I played in the TAC Cup, I played in a premiership there with Scott Pendlebury and Dale Thomas. Um, I, you know, I won a few state medals in athletics, I played represented basketball, I went surfing every night after after school and work. Um, I just loved getting outdoors and at 23 years of age, um, I was playing football for Lee and Gatha in the Gippsland Football League. And a mate went to handball me the football. It was a little bit too far out in front. And as I bent down to pick up the ball, I um, someone running the other way has hit and shoulder me uh, directly on top of the head. Uh, I fell to the ground straight away. Um, yeah, knowing something was was very wrong. I, I I was fully conscious, but I couldn't move anything in my body. I couldn't move my legs. I couldn't move my arms. And I remember yelling out to my brother, who was playing with us, and my teammates, uh, not to touch me because I thought I'd broken my neck. Um, you know, uh, I laid on the ground for 30 to 60 minutes, waiting to be boarded into an ambulance. And no doubt, at that time in my life was was the scariest time in my life. Thought this this can't be happening to me. And yeah, um, I was taken to Melbourne. Um, airlifted to Melbourne where I was operated on. I didn't actually um, break my neck. I, I dislocated it. So they um, had to put my neck back into place and take some bone from my hip and, and put a plate in my neck and, and fuse it all together. And uh, that was when I was diagnosed a, a quadriplegic. So um, me and my family thought a quadriplegic was someone that couldn't move their arms or, or legs at all. It's, it's not necessarily true. It just means... Four, four limbs are, are affected. Um, so I'm just going to stop this presentation for a second um, so I can show you my injury. Um, so I've got no movement. Um, got no movement from, from, my, from my chest here down. Um, I'm in a, in a manual wheelchair sitting here. Uh, I, I can't move my fingers. One, one little bit, so my, my fingers don't move, don't move at all. Um, my chest, I've got a little muscle that comes across the top here, but the major muscle itself doesn't work. Um, my tricep here, I can go, I can go that way, um, but I can't go, I can't go up against gravity. Um, and in my forearms, I can bring my wrist that way, um, but if I had my hand over that way, I wouldn't be able to bring my wrist up up that way so essentially what i do have working is my is my bicep muscles uh my shoulder muscles and, and my neck muscles and and that's about it and then in terms of um sensation if i hold my hands up that way um and you run a, a line from my second finger a line straight line across my body to to that second finger there's like a line that goes across there that everything above that i feel normally and everything below that's just a numb sensation, so I can't feel hot, cold. Um, I can't feel can't feel my skin. I can't feel um, can't feel pain, which isn't too bad. I whack my elbow pretty hard and don't feel a thing there. So um, that's that's happy days. And I'll tell you a story. Actually, I I um my hands are my brakes. So my palms. If I need to slow my wheelchair down, I've just got to push down on my wheels to slow my wheelchair down and when it's raining um yeah when it's raining my 
my hands just slide on my wheels and don't do much at all. And uh, I was at this train station up Melbourne and it was, it'd been raining, it was pretty wet. Um, and it was really wet actually. And uh, I was looking at this ramp, I had to go down. I was like, far out. I'm pretty scared to go down here right now. And I thought, oh, Bo, yeah, harden up. You, you'll be right. You'll be right. And I got about a meter down and I started losing more and more and more control of my wheelchair to the point where, yeah, at the bottom of the ramp, I'm going the quickest I've, I've ever gone in my, in my life. Um, and there was a fair runoff afterwards and I'm thinking, oh, I should be right here, should be right. And I, I was going and then my chair just started going a little bit to the left and nowhere of a lie, there was like one pole there and, and that's it. And um, yeah, but a few metres from the pole, I'm like, oh no, here we go. And I hit the pole so hard and as I hit it, I'm like, oh, that's all right. I, I can't feel my legs anyway. So <laughs> it's not too bad um, not being able to feel a fair, fair chunk of my body at, at different stages when I do stupid stuff like that. So I was in a, um, I was in an induced coma um, after I hurt myself for a week. Um, so yeah, I had my operation on my neck. I, I can't remember going into that or, or you know prior to that. Um, and then I was in an induced coma for a week, and then I was in sort of intensive care hospital um, up until five weeks after I hurt myself, and for the first three weeks. There, I couldn't, um, you know, I couldn't talk. I couldn't breathe. I had a um, tubing going to my neck here that was that was breathing for me, um, and I couldn't eat any food. And for three weeks, I was unable to do all those things. And I never realised, you know, how much I love um, food and and talking until I wasn't able to do it uh, for three weeks. And um, yeah, and then and then I spent seven months in in rehab. Um, so living in rehab, so eight months all up in in hospital um, post post accident, and I had a pivotal moment five weeks after I hurt myself. I um, I'd just been shown around the facilities at the rehabilitation centre, and um, I was in an electric chair. Electric chair. All you have to do is move the joystick forward like that far. Um, and I needed a nurse after a minute to do that for me um, to get back to my room. And I got back to my room and, and yeah, I had that pivotal moment where I essentially believed that stigma and that negative biases, negative biases that having a disability is bad and you can't do anything with your life. And I sat there just crying uncontrollably. I physically um, couldn't uh, couldn't turn on the TV, couldn't turn the page of the book, couldn't physically use my mobile phone. I um, yeah, I couldn't itch my face. I couldn't go to the toilet by myself. I couldn't feed myself. And it, all these negative thoughts come into my mind of you know, yeah, you know, thinking I'm less of a person. I'm not going to be able to do anything with my life. And, and and what's the point of living? And that, and that was a that was a very tough moment um, for myself. But I feel like it was a really good moment as well um, because it made me go, all right, you know, I can't. I don't want to sit here feeling sorry for myself for the rest of my life. I want to make the most of it still and and make the most of what I got. And yeah, you know, I was very fortunate to have great support network around me. Um, and I started setting goals for myself and, and trying to make the most of my life, and which I feel, um, you know, has, has led to positive outcomes for myself now. So I'm just going to get back into my into my presentation. So um, I spent that seven months in, in rehab. Working as hard as hard as I could every day. It would be physio, occupational therapy, uh, weights, um, you know, functional tasks. Just trying to do as as much as I could and and get as independent as I could with my with my living. Um, and I got out of rehab, and I couldn't re uh, return to my previous line of work. 
I, um, you know, I was a tradie before I hurt myself um, and I felt lost. I felt lonely. I had no sense of self-worth and felt less of a person, to be honest. Um, a big part of that was because I couldn't, I wasn't the person I was before and I couldn't play footy. I had no sense of purpose and meaning, um, you know, because I had nothing to go to. I had no work, no footy. And society, my own beliefs, was that I couldn't do much with my life. And I remember back to when I was 17 years of age, I had a bloke come speak to me at an event I was at. And I remember one, one thing he said. He drew up a circle the size of my fist and he said, that's your comfort zone. He drew up a circle around it and he said, that's outside your comfort zone. And he said, the more times you step outside of there, into, into there, the better off you'll be. And that really rang true to me after I hurt myself and when I felt all these emotions. Just more times I step outside my comfort zone, the better off I'll be. And that purely was, to start off with, was going for a push around the block by myself. And I was scared to do that. And then I did that um, amongst a number of other things, gave me a bit of confidence. And then I went to apply for university. Um, my mind told me all the reasons I wasn't because I had so much doubt about myself. And you know, I was like, how are you going to write? You can't hold a pen. How are you going to get there? I didn't have my license at the time. How, how are people going to perceive me in my new situation? Bo, the more times you step outside your comfort zone, the better off you'll be. And um, yeah, and I, and I did that again and, and it gave me confidence. I wasn't on this straight line path. It was, it was ups and downs like everything we do in our lives. Um, it was ups and downs, but um, after I applied for uni and, and was going to uni for a while, I thought, well, I've start, got to start making an income. And um, I applied for a job at the AFL. And, and this one person, um, you know, he, he, took it, he took a bit, bit of a chance, I suppose, onto me, on me. And I got no doubt that the bloke that put my name forward at the AFL and, and wanted me to work in, a, in his team, I got no doubt, um, yeah, because he had had no exposure to disability, that he would have been scared and uncomfortable and there might have been awkward moments on him not knowing what to say and what to do. But he stepped outside his comfort zone and I feel like, you know, that has made him a better person and, and also um, influence that had on the organisation. So, um, my employment experience, um, I got the job at the AFL and before I hurt myself, you'd sort of go into work and, and, and sometimes you'd be like, oh, I can't be bothered working today and, and all this. When I got the job at the AFL, I was just so thankful for having the opportunity to go to work and be a part of a team and, 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 and be able to earn some money and, and do those things. Um, I'd go into work with a massive smile on my face and, and I just love, love being there. Um, and, and I might not have been able to type as quick as what I used to be able to. I might not have been able to grab things off the top shelf. I might not have been able to open envelopes as quick as I, I used to be able to. But I've got no doubt... And and something that I I I, um, I coach I coach football Aussie rules football, and in terms of footy analogy, the person and you can adapt this to what might be appropriate for you, but the person that is the most talented forward in the team, the t most talented forward, if they don't make the players around them better, are they the most talented? Now, I think the best person for the job is the one that makes other people around them better. If you make the whole team better, then, then they are the right person for the job. Now, I might not have been able to do those things at work as quick as I used to, but if I'm rocking up to work with a smile on my face and that's rubbing off on other people and if um, I'm creating connectedness through, through different things and that having a positive influence, then, yeah, maybe I was... A, the best person for, for, for that job and in that role. So now I've just got benefits of employing 
a disabled person. Now, there's stats and figures that come out that, you know, there's stronger financial performance of companies that do employ disabled people when it comes to profit, profitability, more disability inclusive companies, revenues were 28% higher and profit margins were 30% higher. Uh, it, it attracts more talent. So as I mentioned, 2.2 million people of working age have a disability that if you're not opening yourself up to that market, you, you're missing a large proportion. Um, it increases competitive advantage. Diversity breeds productivity, cre creativity and innovation. It improves company reputation. The cost of not embracing um, d and and it re represents the society we live in. You know, um, yeah, it represents a self-explanatory. But it's more than that, it's, it's way more. Um, workplace culture improves. And why? Uh, morale, as I, as I mentioned earlier, um, I went in and, you know, I'm not uh, talking myself up here, but just because at that time I was so excited to be, have the opportunity to work, I felt like the morale of the team around me really lifted. Um, probably provides perspective on life to, to some people as well. I, I know, if, um, you know, I beforehand, um, you know, coming to work and, you know, I just think if someone was coming next to me in, in a wheelchair or, or with, a, you know, that was blind or deaf or had an intellectual disability and they're with a smile on their face and they're working away, just provides a bit of perspective to our lives, I feel. Um, connectedness, um, I don't think anyone can provide connectedness within a team as well as what people with a disability can uh, and resiliency. Um, the three benefits employing someone with a disability, I feel, um, on, a, on a holistic scale is, is one, is the individual. Um, you are you're helping the individual and their family. Um, I went to this day once where there was, uh, uh, we were celebrating people with disability been in, in their jobs for 12 months and the how proud or how up and about the person was or some of the people were, um, but one in particular I'm thinking of, um, for having employment for that long and, and it, just having a job and how excited they were and the difference you made on their life. But then their dad got up and spoke and, and he was crying and, um, you know, just how proud he was of his son and, and the impact it had on him. Then the person that helped him get the job was up there and, and they're, they're just like the emotional and, and the effect, the flow on effect. Yes, you help an ind individual, but the flow on effect to that is huge. Um, the company, as I've spoken about in the last, you know, a little bit is, uh, is a benefit as well for the company. And then as society as a whole, um, improves because of employing people with disability. Now, I think it's very hard in this day and age for people with a disability because we live in such a politically correct society that people are worried about saying the wrong thing. And um, I think saying nothing is worse than and making a mistake and, and learning from it. Uh, but by employing people with disability, it exposes people to disability and, and makes a more inclusive environment, which has a positive influence on society as, as a whole. So I've just got a video video now, I'm just gonna, gonna play. Um, I love this video. Greece Athena High School in Rochester, New York, Greece has a new, most unlikely hero, a special ed student by the name of Jason McElwain. Let's keep it going. Jason is the basketball team manager. For the past couple years, he's been assisting coach Jim Johnson, helping with whatever the team needs. And go! Get him motivated and uh, hand out water and just be enthusiastic. Enthusiastic, to say the least. Despite being born with autism, Jason's father says his son has never had a problem expressing himself at basketball games. 
you know, I was always concerned that he might get a technical and they lose a game because he, you know, start yelling or whatever. Let's have a hard practice tomorrow, all hour and a half, and let's get ready for Arcadia. Okay. Let's go. One, two, okay. three, two. Because he has been so devoted to the team. For the last game of the season, Coach Johnson decided to let Jason actually suit up. Not to play necessarily, just to let him feel what it's like to wear a jersey. At least that was the plan. But with four minutes to go in last week's game, Coach Johnson stood up and pointed to number 52, Jason McElwain. After years of fetching water and toweling off other people's sweat, Jason was actually in a game. His first shot was a 20-footer from the right baseline. Was it close? Did you almost make I just, it? I just airballed it. <laughs> I'm like, just, dear God, please, let's just get him a basket. His second shot missed too, but the third was a charm. A three-point no-doubter. And Jason wasn't done yet. Not by a long shot. If I wasn't there to witness it, I wouldn't have believed it, you know. You caught fire. I just caught fire. I was hot as a pistol. Jason ended up shooting six three-pointers. One right after the other. He had 20 points total. And each time a shot went in, his teammates and the crowd went a little crazier. His last basket, right at the buzzer, created total mayhem. Because he is autistic, Jason says he's used to feeling different. But never this different. Never this wonderful. Steve Hartman, CBS News, Rochester, New York. So, um, sorry, I thought I'd go back to slides. Um, yeah, with that, with that video there, I just think far out, like, I love it because, um, not many people, I wouldn't have thought able-bodied people could create that connection that, um, that that young bloke created there where everyone runs on the court and gets around him and and the connection amongst that amongst that group because of because of that one individual I think I think was huge and I just I love that video. So I really think you know um well before I go on to this point I just want to say when I went to work and, and different things as well imagine I imagine people felt uncomfortable engaging with me at work to start off with i got no no doubt about it people felt uncomfortable with that and and what you um but i'm just and people with disability are just normal normal people they just have different strengths and different weaknesses um and how do we how do we approach them we approach them just like we would anyone else and and chat to them like they're just a, just a normal person and not that any of us are, are normal um so yeah i got no doubt people felt uncomfortable after a little while i i was just seeing it as as another work person as another work colleague and it really helped them break down those barriers and, and everyone started to feel more comfortable around disability and i've been on both sides of the fence and i'm not sitting here saying you know like I would have definitely been that person that felt uncomfortable early days, and and I just feel that now being you know being on that side of the fence and and not being exposed to disability and now being exposed to it, I am a you know ten times better person um, because I have been exposed to it, and I feel like we need to raise the bar on what people with a disability can do. Um, someone with disability is not an inspiration because they get up in the morning um, or just purely by having a disability, they're not an inspiration. Um, and and we need to raise a bar on, on our perception of, of people with disability. You know, if someone had rang me early days and before I hurt myself, said, but in the future you're gonna have your biceps at work, your shoulder muscles and neck muscles and that's it. I would think that that person, you know, wouldn't be happy. I would think that that person wouldn't be able to do you know, anything for themselves, but it's it's not true. Um, we need to raise those bars and, and people with disability can do, you know, some awesome things. And, yeah, I've I've moved on with my life and 
I live an independent life, so you know, I'll get myself, you know, dress myself, shower myself, but you know, cook meals. I I do, I do everything um, that sort of you know, pretty much everything that everyone else would do. Um, I married my partner Lucy. I've been with since you know, 15 years of age, and and got three kids now. Um, I've got my license. I drive around. Um, I, I'm actively involved in my sports. I um, I hand cycle. Um, I won the national championships a few weeks ago for my category um, in hand cycling. I, I play a little bit of wheelchair rugby. I um, kayak. I've got some straps made up for my balance and, and some handles made up for the paddles. I'm able to kayak, take the paddle off, put a glove on my forearm, put a fishing rod in there. I'm able to cast out and, and get some squid and, or reel in with my palm there and reel in some squid and some whiting. Brother comes over and gets them off the line for us. I, you know, I box. I, I do gym work. I'm still very actively involved in my sport. Um, work-wise, I'm a director of two different disability companies. I, um, I've got three other jobs. On top of that, I, I go out and then on, I also go and talk to, you know, schools and organisations and and different things um, like that as well. So still actively involved in, in my work and. And all that as well, which and and to be honest, live live a great life. I'm very very fortunate with things I get to do, and and very happy in, uh, with where where things are at at the moment. Here are some other people. Oh, sorry. I also play a bit of golf, um, stand up chair, and adaptive hand, um, club uh, glove to hold the club, which I swing one handed. I surf. I've got. Um, a surf powered surfboard that's Bluetooth to a watch I wear on my wrist and I'm able to get it out on the waves and, and on waves and whatnot. I um, also coach senior grade football. Um, I've coached for five years. I coached Lane Gather for three years um, and Philip Owen for the last two years. And in those five years, being very fortunate, fortunate to um, make five, five grand finals. Um, that's senior grade football, five grand finals, and the first two we lost at Langather, and then we won the third one. And then the last two years at Phillip Island, being fortunate that the we've gone back to back premiers and it's the first time in the club's ninety year history that ever been able to do that. Um, here are some other people: Kyle Maynard. Imagine all the things he's been told he can't do in his life. Um, he's got no arms and no legs. He's climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. Uh, one of the biggest mountains, you know, in the world. No arms and no legs, like amazing. Um, Stevie Wonder, blind, one of the best musicians of all time. Uh, Stephen Hawking, you know, diagnosed with MND. You know, imagine, you know, he's talking through a computer. Imagine, you know, our perception of these of these people and what they could do. Um, but, you know, one of the smartest physicists and, and he's talking through a computer. Riley Sabin, I'm not sure if anyone would have heard of this bloke, but he's um, got cerebral quadriplegic cerebral palsy, so he can barely move his arms or legs at all. Um, he drives, he's a young, young bloke, he drives his forward drive buggy with his eyes and his eyesight. Um, he's able to do that, and he's got one of the most infectious smiles I've, I've ever seen. He's awesome. Truria Pitt, you know, if she walked into your job, into your office for a job interview, um, you know, you're probably taken back because, you know, just maybe not used to being exposed to different things and, and she's different. Um, she's got third degree burns and she's one of the toughest women I've, I've ever met, uh, I've ever seen, sorry. Um, she's amazing. Um, Richard Branson had dyslexia, um, struggles reading and writing through school, one of the richest people in the world. And JK Rowling um, suffered clinical depression. Ended up going on and, and writing um, uh, the Harry Potter series. So, yeah, you know, there are people, some different people with different disabilities. There's, you know, there's a long, long list. And, you know, not that people with disability have to be famous or anything like that. You know, the person working in the supermarket or, or whatnot, um, you know, that might be meaningful and purposeful for them. And, and they might really love that. And they might have a huge influence on on the people that go in um, to that supermarket as well. So I um, just wanted to show you them. Uh, people with a dif disability have overcome challenges. 
a greater perspective on life and give a greater perspective. They create connectedness, have strengths. I'm big on that one. They have strengths and we need to look past maybe some of their weaknesses because sometimes, you know, we can only see people's weaknesses. And I don't know if many people on the on the listening right now are into their sport, but a big thing what the best AFL teams started doing a few years ago were, were seeing people's strengths rather than what they're not good at and, and working with those and um, really help the best sides um, in that in win premierships and whatnot there. Uh, are hard workers and loyal, are worthy, are people like anyone else in this chat and, and deserve a go. I've just got one more video video now um, to play, which isn't there anymore. Um, Fiona? Yep, there it is. Basically, I'm in my workshop right now. Basically, I'm in my workshop right now. I'm Sammy Lagana, I'm 19 years old and I work at Timbercon. I've been working for Timbercon for two years. My name is Giuseppe Lagana, I'm Sammy Lagana's dad. He had a work placement, that was his first position, that was at year 11 and that didn't work quite well. So this is where Interact came into the, the picture and uh, they were really great. They were able to suit Sammy to the job. They looked around for a position for him. Interact gave me an opportunity to do a traineeship with Timbercon. They understood what I was into and uh, when I went there, I just went like, no, this is perfect. I just love it. My name is Haig Haswell, I'm the Managing Director of Timbercon. For some people with special needs it can be quite difficult for them to get placements either with work experience or also just in work as well. Uh, there's a lot of fantastic people that are out there that unfortunately don't get the opportunity to work um, and I thought it was, it was a good opportunity for us to be able to offer that to, to someone like Sammy. My experience with Interact has been a whole journey with them, they prepared everything for me. The amount of support they give me, well, it's just, wow. Like, they, they've been helping me a lot. And I think that as business owners, um, we have responsibilities for the business and, and some of those responsibilities goes beyond the walls that we're in, you know, and we should try and use our businesses um, to do things that help other people. But at the end of the day, we took a punt on something like this. We started off with a simple work experience and it's now transitioned into a traineeship. And it's done that because we got such a great value out of it, even just on the work experience side of things. I just feel very valuable there, yeah, I do. They give you all the support that is required, but there's a father of They do such a wonderful job and it's, it's overwhelming and fantastic. So, um, yeah, I just want to, um, just in finishing, I just want to say the support's out there for com companies. So there is, um, I work for Interact Australia and, and, you know, they're a disability employment service provider and it doesn't worry me, you know, about, you know, whether you come to us at Interact or, or not. I'm, it's, it's not so much sales pitch. I want you to just be aware that there are supports out there for organisations that is free service. It is free, absolutely free to try and, you know, and there's no obligation there either. If you reached out to someone, let's say Interact Australia, and you reach out, there's no obligation then that you have to do something, but it just provides that support there for companies that, you know, um, to be able to take, take that next step with, you know, wanting, and I've got no doubt everyone here, hypothetically, some HR managers or, or whatnot, want to do the right thing. It's like, how, how do we do it? It's about reaching out to, you know, these organisations and, and interact. So the recruitment phase there, you know, you got support there for 
job analysis, job description, advertising job, job to um, pool of candidates, um, you know, wage subsidies you have access to, delivery of diversity training to, to workforce, you know, um, in terms of your organisation might not be accommodating for all, all disabilities in terms of accessibility and there's funding there to be able to put into your organisation for that. Um, there's, there's so much there. So, so what can you start doing straight away to start, you know, making an impact in this area? I want you just to ask the question, does your organisation represent the whole community and give everyone a fair go? And if not, why not? You know, if, if not, what areas could, could, could be improved? You know, like, what, what, what do you feel on that? Um, job description, it might be as simple as what you can do straight away is when you advertise a job just at the end, you know, have a simple line that's, you know, people from diverse backgrounds, you know, uh, with disability, uh, you know, whatever you want to put in there, you know, First Nation people, whatever it may be, just putting in a line there saying, you know, job applications are very welcomed and, and we want to have a diverse uh, workforce. You know, um, obviously, you know, that isn't a great one, but um, something along those lines um, just to make, you know, people feel more welcome, more included because the amount of the disability community go, oh, sh should I disclose it? I've got a disability, should I not? You know, and just knowing that the company goes, all right, well, we're, 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 in, we're trying to be inclusive and, and we want all applications to come through, you know, it really makes people feel more, uh, warmer to, to your organization. Um, see people's strengths and not their weaknesses, you can start doing straight away. Um, chat to me or someone at Interact Australia, um, yeah, in terms of how we can help help you um, and advertise your jobs through Interact Australia. So if you have a job and, and um, you know, job comes up, you get your applications to come in, you might just want to put it through a disability company such as Interact Australia, They'll um, have a look at their participants and go, oh, this person or that person might suit that job. Those people then apply and then there's no obligation by you to employ those people. But if they are the right person for the job, then you've got a more diverse range of people potentially applying for the job. Here's just a, I won't go through that because I ran out of time, but PwC do, do it really well. Um, this was just at the end of their job description. Um, yeah, just look up the jobs at PwC if you want to have a look at that. And some takeaway message, 2.2 million people of working age have a disability and only 23% have paid employment. Help break down the stigma that having a disability is bad. It's, it's, not, it's not bad to have a disability, it just is a different way of living. Benefits of employing with people with disability, which I, I went over for your organisation, for the individual, for society, you know, the flow on effects, for your family potentially, you know, you might go home, you know, being exposed to different disabilities and impact that might have on your kids or, or whatnot as well. Um, step outside your comfort zone to learn and grow. I've got no doubt disability scares a lot of people and it's all right to make mistakes. And we learn from it, we grow from it. As long as your intention comes from a good place, that's all that matters. Um, raise the bar with expectations on what people with disability can do. Your business gets free support. You might as well try, you know, make the most of that and start actioning something now because I think a large thing in this area is people want to do the right thing, but they just don't start actioning it. Don't look at people like that. Yeah. Um, just, yeah, just says just an email address. Um, yeah, if you wanted to reach out, um, feel free to send me an email. Um, I'd love to help you. And even if I can put you in contact with anyone at all, like to, just to support you, I, I'd really love to do that. So thanks very much. Thank you so much, Bo. That was fantastic. There are a few moments there where I had to 
grab the tissue box to be honest with you uh it was it was really uh it was very look i know you said it but i think it was inspirational bo it was fantastic and i can see from the chat that a lot of people share those sentiments with me so thanks so much now folks we're actually going to still have bo involved in this for the next part of the session we've got a few people involved as panel members who are going to share their stories the first person that i'm really looking forward to introducing to you is john cara george john actually has uh, a background in planning he's going to tell you his story about how he's come into melbourne water and worked for some time with with melbourne water uh, you'll see here that he's uh, got a background in planning as i said and he's he's gone through like Bo, uh, a life-changing situation uh, losing a large part of his vision and having to work through that now john's actually next to me so i'm going to shift this computer over to john and let him share for the next five or so minutes just a bit about his story then we're going to shift after that into talking to Dean Barnett, and then also Llewellyn Prane. So once we've we've had that panel discussion, uh, each of the individuals sharing their stories, then I expect we'll have a little bit of time to answer some of the questions that you pose. So please put those questions in the chat. Even if we don't get time to answer them, we will certainly come back and try and answer them after the session. So thank you. I'll hand over to John now to share his story. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Good morning, all. Um, very excited to be part of this uh, really important uh, webinar. I think um, pretty hard act to follow, Bo, but um, it was very good, um, very inspiring. I know you don't like the word, Bo, but you were inspiring. I, um, I've got uh, a background in town planning. I worked for more than 34 years in local government, uh, ended up being a, a town planning manager for many years until um, I decided that I couldn't read plans and I couldn't do things anymore, but I'd had enough of local government. And um, through Vision Australia, was uh, after a period of retirement, which I wasn't ready for, I uh, went back to went to Vision Australia and they introduced me to Melbourne Water and um, got a, a contract there for a time to um, work in the property management area, which is uh, where I met Peter Morrison for the first time. And um, that that was really good. That was a pretty good experience and getting me back into the workforce and also applying different aspects to town planning. But then uh, that contract finished and I went to another part of Melbourne Water where I was doing the, the sort of back to basics town planning that I was doing as a young town planner, but it was more the excitement of that job was working with younger people and you know um it's an old it's an old one but you know telling them all my dad jokes and and um it was very um good like that um and then i last year i decided i couldn't read plans anymore and made it very difficult for me to stay so i decided i'd had enough but more importantly my experience with melbourne water was very good because and also a lot of the more recent councils I worked at was that there was a culture of trying to help. There was a culture of not, okay, this person's lost his vision or he can't drive anymore or whatever, therefore you can go. That wasn't, that wasn't of course, never entered their thoughts. Um, there was, I was lucky to be employed by, you know, positive, open people, organisations that were ready to help. I had no... You know, at Melbourne Water, which is my, my most recent experience, there was no problems about getting the equipment or getting the assistance or the patience. And a lot of that stuff that Bo just talked about, that willingness to accommodate um, my lack of vision, um, there was no question about whether I could do a job. It was for the way I could talk and I could think and my influence on people and those sorts of things, which were seen as valuable and and I was able to capitalize on them so I think um, the only I suppose don't want to labor the point but I think it's important to have a good culture and that culture has got to filter through so it's not just policies it's not just um, you know having all the right sort of um, legislative backup and things like that I know you've got all the different um, 
legislation which prevents people being discriminated against, but that's not the point. Sometimes it's more the, the organisations can have all those things but still be the worst. So it's got to be coupled with culture. And the other thing that the other sort of take out or the other message that I want to give is that it's organisations have got not only a responsibility for financial you know, uh, stability and things like that, but they've got a, a social responsibility as well. And that's often not given much weight uh, by some, but it's becoming very big in a lot of organisations and they're the ones that are successful, people that have a social conscience. And I think that's sort of, I suppose, um, the, they're the main things. But my experience has been very good. And, um, and uh, more recently, uh, since um, finishing with Melbourne Water, I've been getting into the disability uh, active uh, space. So I've been I've joined the um, Disability Advisory Committee at Mooney Valley Council and getting involved in that sort of stuff. So I'm using my advocacy skills and my cajoling skills, if you like, to uh, try and get some change and get some things happening. So I think um, if it's just trying to find other opportunities um, that can exist. So it's not giving up. It's a lot of the stuff that Bo talked about is relevant to not just me, but a lot of people It's just not giving up and looking around and um, keeping things. I won't go, go on too much because I think um, um, that's all I want to say. Okay. Thanks, Peter. Thanks John. Thanks, John. That was great. So I'm going to pass over to, to Dean, sorry, to Dean Barnett. Uh, Dean actually uh, runs the Intelligent Water Network, so he may be familiar to you. But for this session, Dean just wants to share a bit of the story about how he's uh, been involved in employing someone with a disability and, and talk through some of the uh, some of the experience he had with that and some of the really positive uh, areas that uh, we would like to think that you would share in, in doing the same. So over to you. Thanks, Dean. Great. Thanks, Pete. And it's a great opportunity to be able to share some experiences. So I guess up front, um, my presentation will be just some reflections. And while they're my reflections, it's really not about me. It's about some really good people that I've been able to work with in this space, some um, very progressive organisations that have kept an open mind and some great individuals that have had different abilities. So I guess this first slide for me, the word disability, I guess, doesn't sit well with me personally. And I just look at everyone with different types of abilities. And what I put there is that I'm one of those, is that when you talk about different abilities, you know, if you wanted to turn a Excel spreadsheet into a pivot table, I'd probably be the one of the last people you want to talk to. Or I was thinking about your comments, Bo, about typing and how quick or slow you might be, and I'm definitely in that category. So regardless of ability, we're all different. So I guess that's the point I wanted to make. So some things, I guess in my 30 years in the board industry, I've been privileged to be involved in some recruitment, and I'm mindful that there's the key selection criteria, so that's part, a key part of recruitment. But often we've had the discussion about what does the candidate bring to the table that you can't train them in? And this is a common theme that's been involved in any recruitment that I've been involved with. And it's around morals and ethics and attitude and enthusiasm and commitment and that team fit. You so you can train people with skills, but you can't train them in that. They need to bring those attributes to the table. And that's something that I believe that's extremely important. The reason I highlight that is that, again, that's got nothing to do with anyone's ability on what you can and can't do. This is just about who they are as an individual. And uh, that's extremely important. So when I was reflecting prior to, I guess, this webinar, what was my personal barriers? Um, probably a bit naive. And I know, again, Bo, you touched on this. It was probably around the lack of understanding, um, not knowing how to support, uh, awareness of any special needs. And the answers to, I guess, the barriers that I had in my mind, 
again, are quite simple. So there's nothing earth shattering about what I'm sharing with you all today. So how did I address these issues that were in my own mind? Was really to ask some questions. So to increase my understanding and also my awareness. Um, you know, talk to individuals. What do they need? Uh, review the feedback and also check in with them and overall develop that relationship and trust so that people would feel open enough to talk about I'm not feeling well today or um, you know would you mind if I had tomorrow off or can I change my hours a little bit and again when I was typing up this slide this has got nothing to do with ability is that this has got this is just how we should operate regardless of anyone's ability. So what have I witnessed working with staff with different types of ability? I've watched individuals, I guess, develop personally. Um, confidence is something that's been very obvious. Uh, independence, and I don't mean just in the workplace, but also on the home front. So if you don't have a job, and this is just in general terms again, how do you move out of home and how do you purchase that car and how do you get that independence in your own life unless you've got the opportunity to work so you can see the independence on the work front and you can see also that independence on the home front and it's amazing to be a part of that and again knowledge so again doesn't matter about your ability but in the employment sense is that you gain knowledge you learn about different groups you learn about different topics, you learn about a whole range of different things. And I guess that starts to increase your knowledge base for whatever might be next. So what have I witnessed with working with staff with different abilities? Uh, can do attitude, um, determination and satisfaction. And I reflect on a young man that I had worked with in the past and he had some difficulties in relation to walking. So he, they weren't crutches, they were sort of sticks, walking aids. And I'll never forget, I, um, I watched this young man walk around the office and it wasn't quite easy for him. Anyway, in a general discussion, I just asked him, you know, where do you live and how do you get here and all those sort of things. I assumed that this young man just got dropped off at the front door and his hardest part was actually walking around the office. But in reality, after a discussion, he walked from the train station and got to the office and then walked around the office and did all of those sort of things and never complained, had a great attitude, always happy-go-lucky. So for me, that young man sticks in my mind um, and I find him inspirational in relation to his can-do attitude. So while you're watching individuals just in general develop, it can be quite rewarding too as an employer. I wanted to touch on COVID. So uh, my role at Intelligent Water Networks, I've been in this position for must be 13 months now. And at the interview, no one said that I'll be sitting at a desk working at a computer for 12 months. So I worked in the office, uh, out of Vic Water's office for a couple of months and then got sent home. And I guess when I reflect on the COVID experience and while it hasn't been great, there's also some really positive learnings that are coming out of this. So just say for argument's sake, I was in a wheelchair. There's no reason I couldn't have done this job exactly how I have for the last 12 months because initially I thought I'd be travelling the state and visiting all these different water corporations. And in reality, I've worked from home from 12 months for the last 12 months. I, all my meetings have been virtual. Um, I put a dot point there about virtual meetings is that when we have to, we can make this happen. And the adoption rate of virtual meetings has been fantastic in the industry. And if anything, I feel like we're probably more connected because we've seen each other face to face more often. Having said that, you know, physical is the is preferred when you're developing relationships. And I was also thinking about reduced travel. So if you had any challenges about getting about, um, in this current environment and using virtual technology, there's a big opportunity here. And I think with, that shouldn't be lost um, post-COVID, is that if we can continue on, 
and might keep uh, open mind in relation to future employment for people with varied ability. So it's going to quickly touch on intelligent water networks. So what we're about is we're a member based organisation and we represent 16 Victorian water corporations. And what our intent is, is to test and trial new innovative technology across the state and ultimately turn that into a business as usual tool to drive efficiencies for the water businesses and ultimately the customers while reducing any risk to staff and also impact to the environment. The reason I wanted to put this in context to this group, so I'll just show you uh, what our org chart looks like. So in reality, we have myself, that's a full-time employee and assistant program director, that's probably 0.8 of an FTE. The other red box, the program support is contractors and the rest is in-kind support from the water industry. So the water corporations are providing program managers and deputy program managers and champions and people in working groups. So really the Intelligent Water Networks is run by the industry itself. The reason I wanted to put that into context is that we're currently developing our own diversity and inclusion plan. And John touched on this in relation to policies and procedures, and they're no good if they're just sitting on the shelf. They need to be an active action plan. So I guess at IWN, we call this our call to action. And I thought it would be a good opportunity to share it with the industry that if any individual, regardless of any sort of ability um, and to focus on our, our diversity and inclusion, we're opening it up to say that if you are interested and you believe that Intelligent Water Networks can create an opportunity or create some exposure for you across the Victorian Water Corporation, just let us know. So I touched on this, IWN offers the Victorian industry exposure. Uh, we're implementing our diversity and inclusion action plan, which is not just a, uh, a feel good story or a nice document. It's something that has got actions and that we want to implement. We can offer leadership and industry development. And if you think that this can add value to your career, um, please let me know and you can contact me directly. So that's all that I had to cover today. And again, grateful for the opportunity to share some of my experiences, so thank you. Thanks, Dean, that was great. Very practical, some tips there. By the way, everyone, we're going to have a document a toolkit that we're going to be circulating at the end of this session. Uh, so hang around and you'll get hold of that. I'm now going to uh, bring into the room Llewellyn Prane, who's going to actually share some of the things that she's involved in with the Water Able Network and some of the next, next steps uh, around what's going on there. Llewellyn's been fantastic for our industry and in really advocating for people with all abilities, with disabilities, and she has certainly helped us uh, as Vic Water in really driving and supporting uh, people with disabilities. And we know there's a a way to go, don't we, Llewellyn? But uh, we're certainly on the right path, I believe. So I'll, I'll hand over to you, Llewellyn, to share some of your thinking uh, as we move towards the panel Q&A. Thanks, Llewellyn. Thank you, Peter. And I'd like to acknowledge traditional owners and pay my respects to elders. Um, what a wonderful event. Just great to hear from everyone on the panel and from Bo. I'm really excited to launch uh, today Water Able's first official program. Um, we're calling it Water Able Connections. And what we're doing is inviting expressions of interest from right across the Victorian water industry. Um, and that's, you know, lots of different organisations, not just water corporations, but catchment management authorities, private sector organisations involved in water. And what we want to do is match people with disability who are working with our industry with leaders. Um, we're going to put them into pairs. We're hoping to get lots of expressions of interest and pairing people. And the aim of this is um, for these pairs to share their experiences, to give people with disability an opportunity to network with senior leaders, and also to raise awareness about disability, disability inclusion across our industry, and particularly with leaders. 
we had a little bit of a sneak peek um, of what this might look like at our international data, um, our data celebrate the International Day of People with Disability event last year. Uh, and it's it's true that we had five pairs and um, everyone got a lot out of it. So we're wanting to really extend that out to the industry. There'll be information um, about how the program will run and an expression of interest form that will be coming out from Vic Water across many different platforms, uh, many different emails. So look out for that. And we just encourage people to share that in your organisations because we're hoping to get lots of participants. Um, so there'll be more information available about that soon. Um, but uh, we're hoping to just keep having these really nuanced uh, conversations about disability. And some of the things I wanted to add um, have been wonderfully already shared today um, by each of our um, speakers. And I just, I guess, want to sum up about getting, getting a different mindset about disability, not making any assumptions when you're working with someone with a disability, building trust, um, open dialogue, are helpful and recognising, as we've heard today, that, you know, people with disability bring quite, you know, extraordinary resilience, determination, a really different perspective. Um, and they, you know, all the things that we're told about disability are, are so, are so different uh, to what the experience of having a disability is. And um, I do want to add that um, if today's presentation, if you're watching and you do have a disability and today's presentation has raised issues for you, I hope you were able to step out if it was too much and please um, get in touch with your support networks um, at All Lifeline if the, you know, if the, today's been difficult because it's been a really moving day. I found it very, very moving um, and I'm just thrilled that we have Water Able. At Water Able, uh, if you didn't know, and I, I don't think I said it before, but it's our network um, for people with disability and their allies in the Victorian water industry. And we're also here to support the industry and to support people with disability in our industry. So thank you. We hope we can continue these, um, these nuanced, um, these wonderfully human conversations around disability, because that's, that's what our industry is all about, um, human beings um, and doing great things. So thank you. Thanks so much, Llewellyn, that was great. So we've got some time now uh, just to ask uh, of the panel some questions. And I noticed that Jade had already posed a question earlier to Bo. So if you're available, Bo and Dean, to just uh, pop into this session just with your cameras on, uh, we'll start uh, having a conversation about this. So, Bo, how have you found employment opportunities for individuals during COVID and majority of staff working from home? Yeah, um, Dean, Dean, and, yeah, had a, had some really great great points on on that during his talk. I really love that. Um, but yeah, obviously, early days in COVID, everyone was sort of jumping straight on to you know cutting their staff back. Um, and whatnot, and it was quite a difficult time for people with uh, a disability gaining employment. And then, I, you know, even though right now is sort of seems to be back to quite normal um, in Victoria anyway, it's still probably not on the priority list of, you know, actioning getting people with disability into employment because, um, you know, there's... A lot more talk around flex, you know, focus from organisations going into, all right, people working from home, people at the office. How are we getting people back in? How are we generating our revenue again? You know, all all these other conversations that are probably happening that it's probably put on the on the back burner a little bit, even though, yeah, you know, employment is reasonably back to back to. Uh, I'm not sure what the figures are, but yeah, um, back to reasonably quite normal. I would imagine. Now, so yeah, it's uh, but as Dean said, there is more opportunity now for for people with disability because yes, some people can can catch a train and and walk walk into employment. Um, 
but there's other disabilities that might struggle to do that on a on a day to day basis and and different things and the flexibility that hopefully you know uh, progressive companies have with flexibility around all right well you know if um, you need to start a bit later or need to work from home or or, or the like um, hopefully you know from this moment moving forward that more people with disability have opportunities to, to be employed. Thanks, Bo. Just going to pose a question to John next to me. John, uh, what would have been one thing that you found challenging in coming into Melbourne Water that you'd love to see resolved as a person with a disability? Um, thanks, Peter. Um, the main, I suppose, challenge that I had was, it was more to do with my uh, perspective of how I was viewed, I suppose, but um, challenge-wise, there, there wasn't really anything that, like as an obstacle, um, I can't think of an obstacle that, that was in the way of me doing my job. There was, I think that the challenge, and it goes back a little bit to what Bo was saying, the challenge is, the per, you know, your your own individual sort of um, attitude to how you perceive this or how you're per perceived, I suppose. Mm. Yeah. Do you think that's because of um, John? Do you think that's because of um, like yeah, you know, the world we live in that you know it's yeah, it's different. It's it's scary, that, and that's why your own perceptions like that a bit more. Do you reckon? Well, yeah. There's a bit of that, and it's a bit of um, you know, I want to. I w wanted to make sure that I was doing the best job I could and I didn't want to, I, like, I don't like stuffing up or making mistakes. So whenever I made a mistake, I I was very hard on, on myself. But then, like you've said, Bo, and like I've learned over the years that even able-bodied uh, people or just other people who've got, you know, all abilities um, make mistakes. So I think it's a question of, but as you get, when you have the disability, you're a bit more self-aware or a bit more self-conscious, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. So I might just um, add to that if I can. Um, sure. So I lost most of my vision in 2014 and I started on the board of Western Water in 2015. Um, and one of the hardest things I think is when you're in a new role and you have to ask the organisation to sort of do extra stuff for you so you can do your job as the person with a disability because you feel like you sort of oh, they've got to do all this extra stuff for me. Um, and I wasn't used to having a disability then either, so I hadn't got my disability pride or anything at that stage. So I think, Dean, you touched on this, that, um, you know, building up trust and dialogue and checking in with the person um, and sort of taking that pressure off that, that, you know, that they're asking for this stuff is is a really important thing, just, just understanding that it's sort of hard to be asking for your reasonable adjustments. I think from an employer's point of view too is that you deal with return to work plans hopefully not too often but you know if there's a staff member that's had an injury of some description and I don't see this as being any different and I know we've talked about different types of abilities and those sort of things I think if we're just aware as employers of what our employees need and they are our number one asset why would you not go that extra mile to look after your staff. So I think culturally, if, if our mindset is that staff are number one, then nothing should be a problem, whatever they need. Yeah, and being really welcoming. I mean, just thinking about the same question. Yeah, sorry. You go. Go on, Llewellyn. <laughs> oh, sorry. Just... Um, I was just going to... Gonna... Sorry. <laughs> We've got some delay, folks, but I'm going to hand it to Llewellyn because I think you've got something good to say. So I'm going to shut up and listen. Thanks. Well, I was, I just wanted to add that I was really blown away by Western Water and how welcoming they were of difference, um, how great they were around the conversations around reasonable adjustments um, and, you know, how quickly the organisation sort of adapted to a board member with a, a pretty major um 
disabilities. I use a white cane and I can't read text, uh, you know, so um, I need documents to be accessible. So um, it can be done, and but it's, it just needs a little bit of focus. Thank you. And Dean, I was going to ask this, the question of you, you know, when you were uh, looking to employ people with, with a disability, um, and I'm just curious what challenge or challenges you faced at the time that you would like to think should be overcome? Mm, I think it, um, the thing that comes to mind, Peter, is just the uncertainty. And it's not about the person that's joining the organisation. It was about I guess when I reflect personally, my own internal perceptions and lack of understanding. And I think, and when I touched on this as part of my presentation, it's really about you know, just asking the appropriate questions and being supportive. And you should be doing this with all employees, regardless of ability. So I know, you know this topic is around disability and I'd like to sort of flip that around a bit and say everyone's got different abilities and this, what I went through as part of my presentation is something you should be just doing with any individual that's employed within your organisation. Um, I'd touch on what you mentioned too, Lou Allen, from coming from Western Water as well, is that they were very uh, progressive in this space and the support was from team members, management, executive. This wasn't a individual's idea and while I'm providing my perception, I was fortunate enough to walk, work in an organisation that was supportive at all levels. So from that part, it was quite easy. And then as an individual, I just needed to change some of my thinking. And I guess my whole presentation was quite simple in the sense that you do this for all your employees, regardless of ability. So what I'm talking about, normally it's about technology and all these new shiny things. This presentation is not about that. It's about just treating everyone the same, just like you normally would, and understanding. Mm. Thanks, Dean. And Bo, your role as a director with Interact and, you know, having a passion for seeing people employed from a disability employment provider, what are some of the perspectives you've learned? I suppose just thinking about COVID and some of the challenges or maybe some of the opportunities that, that has has created but also what what are you seeing as some of the great trends that are that are that are helping people with disabilities to get into to mainstream work i think um society is continue to continuing to shift to want to do the right thing by all people all people so you know um 40 years ago you know um you know, disability, women, you know, First Nation people, you know, it's not existing. And, and, you know, over time, over time, um, you know, every society is wanting to do the right thing. So I think um, that continues to, to evolve and, and, you know, obviously women over the last 10 years um, has taken huge, huge leaps. Um, and I really hope that disability is you know one of those next ones that really um help improve helps you know make a difference and 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 have huge impact there so people are wanting to do the right thing i think it's largely you know then putting action action to that um it's probably put on the back burner a little bit just due to COVID um and and the narrative around that and and focus of attention um taken towards that but I really hope that um, yeah, that's a huge thing. But um, trends, and and then and then as we spoke about before, just you know the different different uh, abilities to be flexible with with our work. Um, you know, even if it's yeah, you know, Dean had up there about part time workers in his um, in his diversity inclusion thing. It's yeah, you know, like part time workers. You know, I. Th we are getting, I think, more progressive and, and hopefully this COVID, you know, I, I think in every bad, bad situation, if you want to call it, or challenging situation, there comes growth. And I think um, that the situation of COVID will hopefully provide growth for 
organizations to to move forward and and not be so backwards thinking and we don't have to do i'm obviously coach footy and i always think to myself you don't have to do something because that's what's always been done and 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 just to um think about oh what is actually best for our organization what is actually best for society what is you know not let's just do this because that's what's always been done so I don't think I've answered your question too well. I've gone very roundabout um, there, but um, yeah, I, I really hope that um, the disability area, because I think the best way for society to break down barriers is is to get people with um, disability into employment. And then when people are exposed to me, they realise I'm just the same old bloke that I used to be. Yeah, you know, just sitting here in a in a wheelchair now. Um, um, and I'm and I'm no different. You know, we're all different, but you know, essentially, yeah, no different to to anyone else. And um, it really helps break down those barriers a lot, I reckon. Thanks very much. Now, just as we start to finish up, uh, I'd like to bring to everyone's attention that we've got the files uh, shared now with you through Webinar Jam. They'll also be distributed otherwise, but those two files that you'll see are the Water Able Flyer. And also we've put together a special employment flag fact sheet that will assist you, give you some tips, give you some understanding of where to go, what to do uh, to make the path smoother as we've talked about. Just a finishing question, if I may, to the group. Um, Llewellyn, I'll start with you and, and perhaps others might want to pitch in before we finish up. What do you reckon um, would be a, a key indicator of, of success here if we were to look over the next you know few years? What, what would that be, Llewellyn? Um, well, for me, it's a crude measure, but it is about the numbers. Um, so we, I think the last time we measured it, we were about 4.2%. Of, that's just water corporations um, I have people identifying as, as having a disability. It might be higher than that, but people aren't saying that they have it when, when asked. So I'd like to see an industry where that, um, you know, we increase each year and our organisations are really inclusive and people feel very comfortable um, Identifying as having a disability, especially when you have an invisible one and you don't, you know, you might be hiding it. Mm -hmm. um, so more people identifying, more people employed with disability um, and, you know, high satisfaction rates around uh, diversity in our organisation. Thank you. Any other concluding remarks from the team? The other, if I could. Yeah, I could, John. The, a lot of organisations do these climate surveys where they regularly speak to their staff or their teams about the different things. I think um, in conjunction with the targets and the uh, numbers that Luella mentioned, you, there needs to be some gauging of the attitudes of the staff and management towards people with disabilities. So maybe you know, I'm not sure they do them annually or biannually. I'm not sure what they do nowadays, but um, th those climate surveys are a good way of gauging and seeing how the organisation's trending, I think, in its attitude. And that goes to the culture stuff that I mentioned. Thank you, John. Anything from you, Dean or Bo, before we finish up? I guess what was coming to mind, Pete, is that similar to John's comments before, is that if we're going to talk about diversity and inclusion, are we going to commit to a document on a shelf or are we going to commit to an action plan? And that sort of leans to Lou Allen's comments is, well, what's the measurable outcomes of success with this? So that we're not just talking nice things that we're actually doing. Yeah. No, I'll, I'll, you've summed them up very well there, Dean. I love I love that comment, and uh, the I, I don't know where quotas sit for me. I, I'm not I'm not too sure, but I know that yeah, the quotas we put on females in in workforce really help get more females out into the workforce. So if that's what it takes, then uh, then I'm all for it. And in terms of people not disclosing 
that they have a disability, I think success would be people feeling comfortable and proud to disclose that they've got a disability within the workforce would be would be a really good thing as well. Thanks so much. Uh, we've reached 12 o'clock. I think I can share uh, with the folk that have been listening in and and seeing this session that it's been wonderful. It's been a really good way to understand how do we engage and employ people with disabilities. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Bo. Thank you, John. Thank you, Dean and Llewellyn for your time and for your knowledge and for your passion. It's been great. So that's a wrap. Enjoy your day, everyone, and we'll speak to you soon. And that information, as I said, is available for you to use. So please pick it up off, off the chat uh, as a shared file or we'll distribute it to you otherwise. Thank you. Speak to you later. Bye.